Uh, introducing today's speaker is Mike Simpson. So our speaker today is Josh Carell. He's an associate professor at our local uh, CU Boulder. His specialty is psychology and neuroscience. And like many of us, he's wondered about what sparks our relationships and our reactions to people that aren't of our own group. Unlike most of us, he has devoted his life to finding data that might actually answer those questions. With that in mind, listen closely. We have a lot to learn, a lot that will be very helpful as we look forward to maybe a somewhat less painfully racist and uh, sexist society. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some work that is fairly new. Uh, I hear you all like to ask questions, and that's great. Um, from my perspective, that's the most fun part. Uh, the vast majority of my research uh, over the uh, last 20 years has focused on police officers and their decisions to shoot. Um, one of the things that that spawned in me is a kind of a curiosity about where that, where that impulse comes from, where that threat response comes from, and that led us to focus on faces, faces of uh, in-group and out-group members. Um, I'm going to call them same race and cross-race faces. Um, and as we did, as I, we published several papers on att differential attention to out-groups, um, and, but get, I found myself getting more and more uh, drawn into the question of like, well, in, in addition to the kind of initial threat response that one might have when somebody unfamiliar pops up, um, what other kinds of information can we pull from those faces? What other kinds of information can draw our attention? How do we, how do we think about these, these individuals? Um, in addition to being a member of a, a particular racial category, particular gender category, um, each of these faces is obviously an individual as well. And that led this to this shift in, um, in research focus where we began to start to look at how we make sense of individual, what I'm going to call individuating information, how we learn to see people as individuals. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, this work is, would not have been possible without a number of um, students and colleagues. Um, I'm only presenting three people here who are kind of critical to the, the th three pieces that I'm going to tell you about. Chris Mellinger and Balbir Singh are um, two recent uh, graduate students. Balbir just defended his dissertation yesterday. Um, and Debbie Ma is a, a former student and longtime colleague of mine. Um, the outline for the talk is uh, kind of in terms of a, a kind of a fundamental theoretical question. Um, and then I'm going to talk about problems with <laughs> We came up with what we thought was a good story. And then we started running studies, uh, collecting data, as Mike mentioned, and realized that our story wasn't quite, uh, wouldn't quite cut it. And uh, so I'll tell, you about, I'll tell you about that research. And then I'll talk about um, kind of where, we th where we're heading. Um, so the introduction um, comes uh, f from the recognition that, that people um, re re really generally do a bad job of recognizing outgroup faces. Um, I, we call this the cross-race recognition deficit. Um, people are very, very good at recognizing, uh, individuating uh, two people if, that, if those two people are from the same racial group um, as, the, as the perceiver. But if the perceiver is looking at an outgroup member, it can be very hard to figure out, is this somebody I know? Is this somebody I don't know? Um, this is a widely studied effect, and it's a very robust one. Because um, I want to save time for, for questions, I wanna, I'm going to skip through uh, some of this relatively quickly. We put forward a model that, that basically tried to explain the, this effect in terms of, of two processes. Um, one is a, a process of I think I'm maybe getting both microphones going here. Let's. Um, the, uh, the first part of this process involves the idea that we learn what kinds of information to pay attention to. Um, that we uh, learn when we're looking at members of our own group 
that we should pay attention to this part of the face or that part of the face. And we get very sensitive. We get, we, we're trained. Our, our eyes, our, our brains are trained to differentiate members of, um, of the, our, our group. So if we have a white perceiver viewing white faces, um, this perceiver learns what information to attend to and can differentiate those faces very effectively. But when viewing cross-race faces, um, this perceiver is thought to pay attention to the wrong information and so kind of lose track of the individual differences between those groups and so kind of clump all of the people together into one lump, um, failing to individuate them. In combination with that perceptual learning process, we posited that there was a set of expectations derived from past experience. So if most of my time, uh, most of my life is spent around um, I'm white. If most of my time is spent around other white people, I may have a lot of contact with white people and those white faces that I encounter may shape my expectation for what a face, what a human face is. And so when a face deviates from that expectation, it prompts a different kind of response that focuses on classification instead of individuation. I focus on what kind of person is this instead of who is this. Um, critically, both of these processes um, are kind of don't worry too much about this. Um, this, is our, this is our theoretical model. We spent a lot of time on this, um, but we were wrong. Um, uh, um, but m both of these processes are critically dependent on contact, on the, on the opportunity to interact with people of a different group. Um, if we have a lot of cross-race contact, um, we should learn to individuate those faces, we thought. If we have a lot of contact with cross-race individuals, we should change our expectations about what a person is. Who, who, what, what is it, what is it, what is it a, a real human being look like? Um, that, that representation might shift as a function of our, um, of the changes that we have. So both of these, both of all of our arguments were predicated on the idea that contact would shape the CRD and it, it does. Um, but it doesn't do it as much as, as we, um, as we thought, and it doesn't always do it. So we had run several studies uh, trying to measure the degree to which our participants had contact with racial outgroup members and look at how that changed their face processing. And we just found nothing after nothing after nothing. Um, and I was getting very frustrated because we had built this whole theoretical model around this idea. Um, so we did a very, very large study um, uh, where we uh, identified um, a, a large group of people and then we, we picked people who had very low levels of contact, white white perceivers who had very low levels of contact and white people who had very high levels of contact with, with cross-race people. Um, so, and we use the, we use the kind of the most typical, the most commonly used re me measures of contact to do this. Um, and then we tested them on face processing using the most commonly used um, uh, test of face processing. And we found, um, no, I'm not gonna, we'll skip this. We found nothing. Um, a t-test is a statistical test. Um, it should be around two. Um, th this is a fraction of that. Um, the p-value, the, we found nothing. There was no relationship between contact and, um, and uh, face recognition ability. And so we began to really wonder about um, what is going on here. Um, is, there, is there actually a meaningful relationship? Um, uh, maybe we're just doing a bad job of measuring things. Maybe our theory is fundamentally incorrect. And I think that what I'm gonna tell you about is a combination of these things. Um, so I'm gonna move on to the second part of this. I'm gonna talk about um, some, some efforts that our lab has, has made over the past um, several years to address these questions. First, um, building better measures, um, better ways to measure cross-race contact, better ways to measure the way we've processed faces. Um, uh, second, to talking about what's called a meta-analysis, um, where we test, um, we look at a bunch of other studies and we try to say what are the big patterns that we can see when we, see, when we stand back and, and look at the forest and forget about the individual trees. And then um, finally, um, really uh, a, a line of work that really challenges the, one of the core ideas um, behind uh, the relationship between contact and um, face processing. So um, this is primarily work that Chris, uh, Chris led. Um, we uh, looked at existing cross-race contact measures. Um, the way that psychologists measure, um, measure this thing is usually by asking people. And um, there are a, ver a variety of these scales, but they are uh, all, um, and they all, when you read them, they all make sense, but they are all different. Um, 
they, some of them ask about the quantity of contact that you have. Oh, there's um, uh, Latinx people in the environment. Um, there, you know, I go to a baseball game um, and there are people of other racial groups at the baseball game. Okay, fine. Others ask about friendships, deep, personal, meaningful relationships. Um, others ask about the kind of positive interactions that people have. Um, but they're all over the place and there is virtually no measurement, no, no work to kind of show that these, um, these scales um, uh, behave in a, uh, in a reliable and valid fashion. Um, so Chris and our, our lab developed a new measure um, that looks at uh, four, uh, let me go back here, four factors of, co of contact. Um, and this becomes kind of important later on. Individuated contact. Um, do I interact with people in a way that focuses on their individual identity rather than just their presence in the environment? Friendship, do I have personal, close, meaningful relationships? Um, the intimacy uh, factor is around sharing um, emotional um, uh, bond, like emotional experiences, emotional connections with um, out group members, and then a casual contact, which is like at the baseball game, there are people around me who are not, not white. Um, and so we have used this scale now, um, and we can, um, uh, it, we've done a, well, a variety of different tests with this. Um, and critically, we can use this scale, we can use this scale to measure uh, contact and show that, that the, the degree of contact does, to some extent, um, change the way we process faces. Um, so I'll come back to this at the end. Um, the second concern that we had is just like, and, and it's partly addressed by the point that I just made, but like, it, like, what is the real relationship out there? What is the, like, in truth, not just in one study that I run, but in, in the world at large, what is the relationship between contact and the way we process faces? Um, so Balbir uh, led this project and he um, did a, a meta-analysis where we identified um, a very large number of studies um, with a, ver a very large number of, of separate tests of this question. Um, don't, yeah, we don't worry about the R estimate. Um, we pool all of these, these different studies together and we kind of, we, we back up and we can look and see, is there a relationship between contact and uh, face processing? What, when do we see that relationship most strongly? And so that's really what I wanna tell you about. Um, the short story is um, there is a relationship in general if people have more cross-race contact, they do a better job making sense of faces of racial outgroups. Um, but that's particularly true if they had contact during childhood. So the orange bar here shows that uh, when, uh, when people are tested um, very early in life, or when, they are, when we're talking about cross-race contact that occurs very early in life, uh, it has a profound effect on the way that they process faces. Um, contact matters later on too, it matters um, even late in, into adulthood, but the effect is much weaker and much harder to detect. The other thing that was really interesting from this meta-analysis, um, and again, comes back to something that I'll tell you about at the end, uh, come, has to do with the way that people, that psychologists study contact. We can ask scale, you know, we can ask people to self-report their, their contact. We can um, infer that they had contact based on their zip code or their whatever. Um, uh, but the most powerful way to do this is to do it systematically, um, to manipulate contact. So when we look at studies where the experimenters actually bring people into the lab and provide them with training, training to individuate cross-race faces, it has a very, very big effect on the way that they, uh, they, they operate, even weeks and months later. Um, if we just ask about contact that they had during high school, you know, there is usually an effect there, but um, it's not anywhere near as, as, as profound. Um, so the story from these first two pieces is that, that yes, there is a relationship between the, the experiences that we have, the, the, the personal interactions that we have, um, and the way we make sense of, of the faces that we see. Um, the last thing I want to tell you about, though, is this um, is a work um, that was that, uh, heavily involved Debbie. Um, that looks at the nature of that effect um, because it, it is different than um, our, our assumptions were somewhat, somewhat wrong. We had assumed that the kinds of experience that we have um, tune our visual system. Um, and for the, the easiest example for me for this was uh, my son, um, who is now five, when, when he was three, would, um, he couldn't read anything, but he could, dif he could differentiate all kinds of trucks. Like, he would say, oh, that's a Dodge Ram. And I'd say, oh no, A-Rod, that's not, that's not a Dodge Ram. And then I would look closer and it would, sure, sure enough, it was, 
It was a Dodge Ram. Um, and he's doing this based on what? Um, he's doing it based on the patterns of the taillights, it turned out. Um, if you take that information away, he can't do it anymore. But he's, he doesn't need the information that I need. <laughs> I need the logo. I need the, you know, the Ford F-150 sign on it to know that it's a Ford F-150. But um, he could just look at them and tell. Um, dog experts and bird experts um, learn to individuate, uh, learn to dis discriminate between different kinds of, of species uh, based on a holistic pattern of, of information in those um, in those. Uh, in the, in the different dogs and the different birds. And we had thought that the same kind of thing is, and, and you know, to some extent this has to be true, but we had thought that the same kind of thing happens with faces. That when you're looking at white faces, when I'm looking at white faces as a white person, I have learned how to differentiate them. And that the idea here is that black faces differ on fundamentally different, in fundamentally different ways. And if I don't have contact with black people, then I have trouble differentiating them. We can't find any evidence of this. Um, we have tested this again and again and again in a variety of different ways, looking at where in, what kinds of information differentiate white faces, what kinds of inform information differentiate black faces. White faces and black faces, you'll notice, have the same features. They move in the, like, nose length varies from face to face. Um, cheeks vary from face to face. But all of these have the same features. Dogs and birds and, like, there are fundamental differences in the way that the configurations occur. But in, in faces, that's not true. And so we looked at, um, at hundreds of faces. Um, and we have kind of quantified where information meaningfully differentiates white faces and Asian faces and Latinx faces and black faces, and it's all in the same place. It's all the same kinds of information. Um, so here are Asian females and Asian males and black females and black males and uh, Latina females and Latino males and white females and white males, and in every single case, the most useful information in those faces is occurring in exactly the same places. It's around the eyes, it's around the, the nose and the mouth. Um, so if I, as a white person, learn to pay attention to that kinds of information, maybe I already have the tools I need to differentiate um, faces of other racial groups. Um, I'm going to skip this. So the, the, the crux of this is that contact matters, but it probably doesn't matter by changing the tools, the, the perceptual tools that we have uh, to differentiate one group of faces from another group of faces. Um, um, our thinking now is that this is really uh, about expectation. So less about learning what kinds of information to attend to and more about shaping the expectations that we have for what a face looks like. And that if we can start to think about um, paying attention to the individuating information that exists in a face, regardless of whether that face is the same racial group as me or somebody else, if we can, if we can, if we can, can, can get over that initial, that gut response that says, oh, this person is different from me, then maybe we can use the tools that we already have to individuate those faces. So the last study that I want to tell you about, and I'm skipping ahead, um, is a study where we had people rate a huge, um, a huge number of people rate a, a small number of faces, and we can look at the, the degree to which each of these perceivers is using race-based information versus other kinds of information. And what we see here is that the more that participants are using, the, the more contact they have, the, these are white participants, the more contact they have with black, with black people um, using the scale that Chris developed, um, the more they are, they, the less they care about race when they're judging these faces. They don't draw a strong differentiation between white faces and black faces. Rather, they attend to other kinds of information. Um, so these plots show the, de the degree to which people are attending to race on the, y on the x axis and the degree to which they're attending to other kinds of information on the, on the y axis. So and what this is showing is that the more people are attending to race, the more that they are weighting race in the way that they see these faces, the less sensitive they are to other kinds of information in the faces. They're losing, they're losing the individuating information by focusing on race. Um, and as they get more and more contact, they're less likely to focus on race and more likely to focus on that other kinds of information. And again, we think this isn't because they are suddenly gaining new tools, but rather because they are learning to, to use the tools that they already have in a more effective way with cross-race faces. So with that, I will um, stop talking.
and say thank you. And um, I'd love to have questions. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful presentation that was really interesting. Um, you studied white people. It, does the same information apply to a black person or an Asian person as to how they look at white people? As far as we can tell, yes. Um, so we, um, in, in most of these studies, uh, the, the samples were white, but we have done, and at Bold, at Boulder, it's, it's hard to do a, a lot with other um, participant groups, but we can do a lot of stuff online. A lot of our studies we can do online as well. So in the, that last study that I told you about, there were something like 650 white participants, but there were also uh, 350 black participants. Um, and we do see similar patterns of behavior there. It's a little bit different, though, because um, for black people in the, in the United States, they're more likely to have uh, higher levels of contact with um, with white people, um, even if it's just like media exposure. Um, but um, but they're more likely to interact with white people than white people are statistically to interact with black people. So they typically have higher levels of contact, um, and so we see some pap some differences in the in kind of the mean levels of of these phenomena. But uh, um, we think yes. that the same basic processes are ho hold for both groups or for all groups because it's it's a multifaceted thing for sure. It's a great question. Yes. Um, we have a question online from Laurie. Would you like to unmute yourself? Sure, I can. Um, thank you so much for being with us today, Joshua, and, and for the work your team has done. I'm just so curious that since the pandemic and so much mask wearing, <laughs> right, have there been any studies that particularly sh you know, show, especially studies of our younger population, because it sure seems that children in the ages of, say, two to five right now will be so much better at reading people's eyes, having better eye contact, and all of that. I'm just curious, um, have you guys addressed any of that? Um, we have not. Uh, there are a number of people, um, a lot of developmental psychologists um, who have focused, who, who are focusing on that, and I think we have a lot, um, I think we're going to be We'll be learning a lot in the years to come, um, uh, and it's yeah, it's a huge it's a huge question. Um, it is interesting to think um, that that mask wearing focuses attention on the eyes. Um, there's a lot of debate about the role of the eyes, um, but it is not clear, uh, in spite of the kind of um, kind of poetic idea that um, that they are, are they they convey special information about. Um, about who we are as people, there's not a whole lot of evidence, of very strong evidence, that the eyes um, play a special role in the way we process in-group and out-group faces. Um, so I don't think it will fundamentally change um, the, the, the effect of race on, on processing, but it, it is, it's, it's, it's gonna be, it's a horrible experiment, it's a horrible quasi-experiment to, to have been, have gone through and to, I mean, my, our, my son is five and my daughter is is three, um, and so you know they've uh, a huge part of their 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 childhood, a huge part of their life has been in a in a world where everybody has masks on, and I just I it makes me shiver to think um, what that's going to do, but we don't know yet. Great, we have a question right here. Thank you. So, um, how did racial bias factor into your study? In other words. Did you normalize all of these subjects so that they had the same degree of racial bias before they were asked the, the questions? Or did racial bias affect your results? Um, so we don't, um, we don't have a way to standardize it beforehand. Um, but what we do is measure it in the context of these studies. So um, in all of these studies, we have measures of um, Sometimes of, sometimes of fairly subtle patterns of racial bias, but in all of them we have measures of um, kind of overt uh, antipathy toward, toward black people. Um, and so we use it as a statistical, as a control variable in our, in our analyses uh, to make, to guard against the possibility um, that it is, it is 
part of the process. But it, it, it actually ends up being a kind of more interesting question than that. Because one of the things that we know is that cross-race contact, one of the things that we believe is that cross-race contact can actually reduce bias as well. Um, so it's, it, and it may be, and this is, this is really a huge part of, um, of the genesis of, like, of this work and my interest in it, is, is the idea that these two things may actually be related. That through, by virtue of having contact, particularly individuated contact, where I learn to see people as individuals, or friendship-based contact, um, that I may, again, become kind of desensitized to the differences between, you know, white people and black people, or um, Asian people and Latinx people. That I may, I may, may lose track of those those kind of buckets that we put people in, and start to be able to focus more on the individuating information, like oh. No, it's not a, it's not a, a Latino person, that's John. Like, I know John. And that when I start to see people in terms of their identity and not in terms of their, their category, that we may actually undercut bias. Um, and so there's some evidence, there's some evidence to this, um, about this effect. And we are working uh, right now to, um, well in the fall, we will begin testing, um, testing an intervention that is designed, an iPhone app, um, that is designed both to, provoke, to, to, to provide training that will help people individuate faces, but also reduce racial bias. Um, because the two things may be, may share some kind of psychological mechanisms. So um, you mentioned something about police officers yes. initially. How are you using this information with police, if you are? We are not currently. Um, so uh, for a long time, um, my research focused on decisions to shoot um, in a in a little in a simulated in a simulated police encounter. Um, we would uh, present white and black targets, and we would ask uh, p uh, regular people, you and me, college students, uh, but also police officers, to try to make their make these decisions as quickly and as accurately as they can. Um, so. At present, we are not trying to connect this, um, this, the current work on face processing to that. But if we can show, if we can start to show with, with this um, intervention that we can reduce bias in other measures, we will certainly bring it back to that deci those decision making, um, that, that task where we can look at decisions about, um, about hostility and threat. Fantastic. We have a question online from Merrill. Merrill, would you unmute yourself, please? Got it. Good. Uh, so this is a, a personal experience, so it's anecdotal, but it's interesting, and I'd like to hear your thoughts. When I was 16 years old, I was hired as the first white teacher at a daycare center in the inner city of Atlanta. Everyone, students and teachers, were African American. It was the 60s, and I had had very little contact with children who are African Americans. The children spoke with a thick African American Southern dialect very thick. The first day, I literally could not distinguish any of the children's faces, not one. I could tell boys from girls, but that was only because they had gender-connected hairstyle. I also could not understand any of what any of them said, so I alternated between yes and no and limped through. What's interesting is that by the third day of work, I easily recognized all the individual faces. And I could understand everything that anyone said. I was taken aback by the rapidity of its happening, both in facial recognition and language comprehension. It's something that's impacted my life ever since, especially regarding people's stereotypes about different racial groups. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that experience. Uh, my initial thought is, are you available to come into the lab? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm no longer 16, I'll have to warn you. <laughs> That's okay. Um, <laughs> Be happy to. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we think that though, and, and, and I, I like the point about the rapidity of the change because just like, if I'm gonna argue, if I wanna argue, if I wanna argue this point, um, the idea that you would develop a new set of cognitive tools in the, co in the course of two days, um, I'm not sure I buy it, but the idea that you could take an existing set of cognitive tools that you have and apply them, learn how to apply them to a, a, a slightly altered scenario, that I believe. Um, 
and I, I, like, I like this anecdote. I recognize that it is an anecdote and it is not data, but, um, but I like it. Um, we have studied, um, so, so the, the experience that you went through is what we would really like to be able to simulate, um, or, or not simulate, but provide. Uh, it's, it's a kind of a rare thing that, that a few people go through. Like, we've been talking with, um, with JET, the, the Japanese language, um, uh, the English language um, uh, training program in, in Jap that uh, sends Americans to Japan. Um, we've um, thought about uh, trying to study um, Peace Corps volunteers or re returned Peace Corps volunteers. Um, there's, there are these people who go through these intensive, intensive experiences where um, they, they 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 start they start out like like me and then they go through this experience and and the question is can we can we see um, can we see the 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 change um, we're doing we're just wrapping up a study right now where we have identified people it's kind of flipping that question on its head identified people in the in the Boulder in the CU Boulder um, subject pool who are really really good at identifying um, cross race faces. Uh, and we're bringing them into the lab, and we're we're studying eye tracking. So we 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 you know we measure how and where they look. How how do they encode a face? Um, does the way that these um, pop, these special kind of um, golden participants is 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 there something different about the way that they encode a black face um, compared to the way that the rest of us encode a black face? Um, but the other thing that we're going to start in the in the fall is taking people who have um, this is actually an honors project from. So, um, uh, one of our, our, our research assistants um, had this idea, and I, and I really love it. And so we're going to try to identify people who have had profound experiences of, of cross-race contact and bring them into the lab, too, and do the same kinds of eye tracking, um, eye tracking measures, b a bunch of different cognitive measures um, with them as well. Um, but I, yeah, I think it's a really interesting question, and I think it's the kind of thing that... Um, I mean, again, we believe that contact makes a difference, that with increased contact, we can learn to see people in terms of their individual characteristics instead of their, their, their category. Um, but in, for most of us, unlike, unlike you, un, right, for most of us, we don't have this kind of sledgehammer contact experience. Um, the people who, are high level, who have high levels of contact in our study, sometimes, you know, their friendship networks, their social networks include something like 20% of outgroup members. It's still 80% white. Um, so it's not, the, it's not the same kind of thing. Um, and, and I'd love to be able to study those really, really profound um, experiences. Um, yeah, yeah, Josh, one thing that comes to mind for me is whether any of this kind of research has been done looking at gender identification of spaces. And, and the reason I ask is I have had a fair amount of experience seeing women who are accused of being angry or mm. irritated by male colleagues when the women don't have that perception at all. So there seems to be that kind of disagreement as well in interpretation of faces. Yeah, the expressions of emotion are really interesting and they um, and, and complicated. Um, the, the the pattern that you're talking about is something that uh, um, it's we don't study it directly, but a, um, a number of, of a number of people do, and it is certainly the case that like when it often so one of um, my former advisor and um, colleague who um, also at, at CU um, studies women and um, associations with like work and and, and family life. And there's a, a very profound effect there, which, which is that when women are put in leadership positions, they're often accused of being really um, nasty um, for doing the same kinds of things that men do all the time. Um, so where that comes from, whether it comes from the um, misperception of actual facial emotion or rather from some kinds of stereotypes that we hold about, um, I mean, that you could hold, what, an experience that you could have with your eyes closed um, where you would never actually see the face um, and, and sets of expectations that we have for how women and men behave in, in leadership roles and how that how those differ. Um, I don't know that that I don't know that we have clarity on where that comes from um, the, because you can also get the opposite effect, right? Like you can get um, the idea that 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 anger emerges in a black male face 
um, there is some evidence that people, white, white people perceive the emergence of anger in a black male face much more quickly than they would perceive it in a white male face. So there you kind of have like maybe a hostile expectation um, that is being confirmed by a, 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 a shift in the facial expression. Whereas with women, women are at least stereotypically would be characterized as, as less likely to be angry. Um, and so maybe the, 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 the momentary expression of anger is seen as more, more surprising in that case. Um, but it, it would be funny, it would be funny um, funny is the wrong word. It would be annoying um, and um, but perplexing if we would get get um, in, enhanced perception of anger in in the faces that we would typically think are not angry. That's a really I don't I don't know of anybody who's looked at that. It it might actually be interesting to try that. Um, but it, again, it, in a, there's a lot of work that would support the basic thing that you're talking about um, that is not around face perception per, per se. Um, but it's an interesting. It's an interesting idea. It, uh, we might. I might. Need to, we can talk a little bit after. Go for it. No royalties. <laughs> you can be a co-author. Um, we. Uh, I would just like to say that we have a lot of questions. Um, we might not be able to get to everybody, but we do have a question online from Dominica. Yes. Good afternoon. This is extremely interesting to me because I am one of a very, very, very small minority in a country in which the majority of people are of African descent. We do have a Chinese uh, minority, an Indian minority, and the smallest minority is white. Um, have you considered doing a similar research in a country like Jamaica, where, yeah, somebody did ask the question, do black people feel the same way? And I would say yes. Uh, you know, people do say some people I have heard say things like white people all look the same, you know, that kind of thing. Um, have you thought of doing a research in, in a majority black country? Um, in a majority black community, is that, was that the question? No, in a majority black country. Yes. Yes. Because you did, you did admit that, that in, an, in the United States, it would be difficult to do, do the same kind, kind of study with a, per, with a group that is in a minority and is forced to interact frequently with the majority group. Um, yeah. You would have, find the opposite way wrong in a country like Jamaica, where I live. Um, we, uh, one of my big goals in life is to cultivate um, destination research um, where we travel, we <laughs> where I get to travel to, um, to new places and um, and and test test the, these ideas, um, we I would love to I would love to do it in a variety of different locations. Um, some people have have certainly already done that. There are a number of really interesting studies. Um, uh, most of these are fairly fairly old at this point, but they would they would test um, white participants and black participants in say England and South Africa. Um, and uh, that is certainly the genesis of uh, well, it it helped shape a lot of the a lot of our questions, a lot of our thinking, um, uh, and that, that work is really interesting. The work that we have done uh, most recently, uh, actually at, on my table, um, the 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 flat flag. What do you what do you call those? Banner. The, the banner is from Nara um, in Japan um, with the with the deer. The, you feed the the deer will bow to you, and you feed them. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so we have um, we have begun a, a set of projects looking at white the perception of white and Asian faces um, in both uh, in the United States and in Japan and also in, in China um, and the the question there is actually I think uh, um, I mean I, I think I think that, yes I would love to do I would love to do more of this kind of work there are really interesting questions that start to emerge from that um, some some in terms of asymmetries in the nature of the effect. Would, but in general, I think we would we, we expect that the same processes will apply across across different populations. Um, but it it also sets up all kinds of re really interesting um, subsidiary questions that we can start to ask. So, for example, in a lot of places other than say the United States and Australia, um, Canada, um, uh, people live in in locations where their great 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 grandparents lived and. Um, that sets up expectations about not just kind of, you know, race, um, 
race is a, a, largely a social construction, right? It maps onto phenotypic differences in, in faces, but it, it's, it's just not a thing there. Um, uh, but there are, within race, within racial groups, there are, there are subordinate groups that may operate in very similar ways. So for example, um, the, the uh, phenotypic, the, the patterns, that, the, the morphology, the facial morphology that we see in northern Japan, say Hokkaido, um, is qualitatively different than, the people look different in Hokkaido than they look in Tokyo. Um, and they look different still in Okinawa, right? Like th those, are, those are meaningful regional variations all within Japanese society. And Japanese is, you know, Japan is noted for its, its homogeneity um, culturally. Uh, can we compare those to faces from different regions in China? Can we compare them to white faces in the United States? Um, and the, I the idea would be that, you know, for a Japanese perceiver, um, the difference between somebody from Hokkaido and somebody from Okinawa is going to be is going to operate very much like, uh, you know, the difference between this racial group and that racial group for somebody who doesn't, you know, for an American viewing viewing Japanese faces, all of those faces probably look Japanese, but for for somebody from from Hokkaido, the, the, it's probably a meaningful meaningful pattern of variation. So I think there are lots of different kinds of um, of ways that we can deepen and, and refine and, fi and kind of tell a more nuanced story um, if we can get out of the box of, um, of studying, um, you know, 21 year old, rich, white kids. Um, there's, a, there's, a lot, there's, a lot to, there's a lot to be learned, so. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna take one, we're gonna take one more question, thank you. Hi. Hi. I'm sort of curious on your thoughts. I have noticed that recently um, television commercials are, sh are showing families that are mixed race, mixed culture, people working together. How is that going to affect people's perception? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really interesting. I think it's really interesting. Um, um, one of my graduate students right now is really interested in me media exposure, and I, I think there's some really interesting questions there, not just in terms of advertisements, but right, like if you are um, if you are binge watching Dear White People on Netflix, um, you know, is are you are you training yourself? Um, are you training yourself to to understand? Um, there have been a lot of. Um, uh, there have been a lot of ideas ab about that uh, with some kind of mixed evidence. Um, for example, there was a, an old study that has been subsequently kind of debunked, but it, it was looking at people who are devoted to the National Basketball Association, who like watch, watch a lot of basketball games because a lot of basketball players are not white. And the idea was that those, um, those fans, those super fans, might be better able to differentiate um, black faces than, than you and me. And, um, and I th that, that study has um, presented some compelling findings, but has not, has not replicated um, consistently. Um, but, but I think fundamentally, the, the, hope, the hope is there that we can have some kind of mediated, you know, con we don't all necessarily have to, um, to um, start teaching in a, uh, uh, kindergarten where where in Atlanta where everyone is where all the children and all the teachers are black like we can maybe have have ways of training ourselves that require that that we can do um, more more simply more conveniently um, I mean I'm all for if people want to go um, um, go have those those deep really rich really human um, ex exposures, that's great, but it's not always going to be possible. So actually the thing that we are working on testing right now is related to the idea that media mediated exposure, mediated contact may actually work. So it's an iPhone app that's going to operate kind of like Duolingo, um, where you would train yourself over the course of eight days, um, learning a new group of faces each day of, of a racial outgroup. Um, so uh, our hope is, our hope is that, that yes, that, you know, like that kind of exposure Maybe, maybe not as, as good, maybe not as powerful, but it, that it can make a difference. It can change the way that we 
um, represent these groups and 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 again maybe hopefully reduce not not just reduce our or not just improve our ability to recognize those faces but maybe actually fundamentally reduce the, our kind of implicit bias um, the kind of bias that might lead a police officer to incorrectly pull the trigger um, because he thinks that guy just looks like a threat he just looks threatening but if he can see the person behind the the race um, maybe he can get away from that so that's what we're going to be I mean hopefully we'll be exploring that um, uh, in the fall, and uh, maybe I'll have I'll have maybe I'll have good news um, before too long. Wow, Josh, thank you so much for giving us a a science based peek behind the curtain of our own minds, and literally speaking to what we might be able to do to overcome this implicit bias yeah. that we we all know we have, but boy, it sneaks up. Uh, in your honor, uh, we're donating 100 doses to the polio vaccine fund of, the, of Rotary, which is very much a part of, you know, this is one of Rotary's great big projects for over the last 35 years, and we're very close to eradicating polio. So we want to honor you, and thank you for being with us. Well, thank you so much for having me, and I'll, I'll say my, my father had polio, um, so I appreciate that. And Mike, just let me say thank you so much for the invitation. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and join you. It's been fun.